Good morning, coaches. Good to see you all this morning. I'm going to have everybody just throw themselves on mute. Ross, good to see you. Chad, Josh, bunch of bunch of good names showing up right here. Steve, good to see you too. Craig Donaldson, good to see you. Aurora, oh, look at this. Right, so I was just working on my little intro to this. So this is my intro for Monday Morning Masterings. And this is what I got so far. The best place for coaches to come on a Monday morning as long as you're on the west coast of California, uh, to develop the skills that they need to have success in their business. I want to make sure every week when you all spend the time, half an hour with me to get on this call, that you're going to leave with action plans that you can put into place. It's going to change the way you think, which means it will change the way you act. And in doing so, drive massive benefits to your player, to your facility, and obviously to your business. So with everybody joining on right now, today we're going to talk about simplifying your teaching, five ways to drive down your scores. Now, as always, I'm going to open up the chat box so you know that we're going to be uh, saying hi to everybody here. So I've got my chat box on the screen so you can fire in answers to these questions. But one of the biggest things that I hear on a weekly basis from coaches from all over the world, which many of you are, for, I see Spain, I see Australia, I see... Uh, where else I see Canada, um, is that this concept of, you know, how do I get lower scores for my players? How do I get them better? And I think the number one thing that I would challenge you all to start to look at, and we talked about it last week, is this concept of referrals. You know, when somebody refers you, it means that they are, I believe, a raving fan. If you get somebody to re-sign, I believe you can still get that out of desperation, where someone is like, I still need to get my game better. I, I, I believe in you. I still, I still need that lower score. I need to fix that slice, whatever it may be. And they're moving towards their goal. But when someone refers you, it's because you've gone above and beyond. It's because someone believes in you so much and has got the results that they want their friends and other people that they play golf with to experience what you've had to experience. And that can happen after one session. It doesn't have to happen after 10 weeks of coaching or a year. And I believe the quicker you can get those results to happen, the more impactful it is, which means the more re-signs you get. I believe in business, the most important thing that every business understands is cash flow. If you want a successful business and you want to sleep at night, have cash flow. That means money coming in each day. And the best way to do that is make sure that your referral business is really strong. And the only way to do that, I've found, is to make sure you get results. You could be great at sales and sell people on an idea, but if you don't actually get them the results, guess what? They don't come back and they don't send their friends. And so today, what I want to do is I want to start off, as always, with a little question. And this is something that I love to do because it just makes me smile every time I ever go out, which hasn't been lately to parties because of COVID. But I know we've all done this before, right? Where you've gone out to a party and quickly people realize that you're the golf professional. And so they're going to start asking you about golf and telling you all their stories about their golf game. But what I love to do is I love to ask them if they take lessons. They're super happy to talk to a golf pro, but I ask them, you know, do you take lessons? And so often I hear, no, no, I don't. Or I did in the past. Or, well, I, I did once. Often I even hear them being proud that they don't take golf lessons anymore. They're like, no, 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 that didn't work for me. I, I do it all on my own. I watch YouTube or whatever it may be, the craziness that they've decided to go on. So my question to you today is this why people don't take golf lessons, the most common answer people give. Okay, so in the, uh, in the text box right now, as I talk you through one of these stories, I want you to go ahead and type in there the number one reason, okay, that people don't take golf lessons. And, and as I said, I just love asking people this because the, the answers that you get are hilarious and it's, it's hilarious in a way of painful if you're a PGA professional because you, you start to realize what their perception is of actually improving at the game of golf. So we've got things like, I'm not going to get the results. I don't want to get worse. Can't afford it. Um, oh, yeah, I don't need help. Um, the commitment level. 
uh good ones they think the teacher will give them so many things to have to work on you guys are all in the golf industry you hear the stuff that i hear <laughs> so yeah it's exactly things like that so let's go through i'm going to give you the four that i see the most and i've heard the most so it's too expensive which we've got i will get worse before i get better i think that's one of those big ones of you know like i don't get that much time to even play golf let alone to go out there and actually start get hitting the ball worse um, the next one I hear a lot is I don't want someone to change my grip. It's not even, it's not even that thing of like, they're thinking about improving. It's just literally, they feel so uncomfortable when somebody makes change with them. Right. You know, they just don't want that. Let's see. I've got a few more coming in, uh, tired, um, tr tr sorry, tried, uh, tried that already too much money. Um, I like complaining about my golf game and not getting results. I like that one, Chad. Um, and then finally, I don't believe it will actually help me. So I want to go ahead and see from all of you, money on the line right here, is it A, B, C, or D, the most common response? So let's go ahead and see what they say. Uh, Joel Sugg says the pro was a jerk. Yeah, I've heard had ones there before where the pro didn't help them, but that's okay. In the, in the chat box, come on, let's see who's going to get it. I want to see the majority. Craig Donaldson, B, D, 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 Brian Wise, B, D. A, B, okay, so they're coming in right now, Jose C. I think we're gonna all hear all of these. What I think if we actually look at this and we dig down a little bit deeper, it's too expensive, what does that really mean? What does it's too expensive mean? It means to me, there's no value, okay? So the, the idea is there's no value in what I'm gonna get. So A is a value proposition. B, I'll get worse before I get better. What I think about this one for me is this idea of, you know, this, I, I don't want the result they're offering me in terms of, I, and C as well. I don't want to change my grip. I don't want to have to do all this stuff. I just want to get a little bit better, a few lower scores. And so often golf professionals sort of impose on a student, you can't swing it that way. You can't hold it that way. You can't do that from around the green. And, and it's almost that inferiority and that uncomfortable feeling of being around a pro because they're going to change you so much. So what it really comes down to is all three of those are saying no value <clears throat> and I'm going to get worse and I don't want to change, which the number one that I hear is D. So any of you that got D, please send me a um, uh, just an envelope with a stamp on it and I will send you a check, $100 uh, for each of you. The postage at the moment is a little slow, so don't hold on too soon for that coming. But I hear over and over again, I don't think I'll get better, Will. And if you really dig down, I want to challenge every one of you to do this. When you meet with somebody and you're just talking at a bar or you're meeting with a person, they realize you're a golf pro, ask them, they, they play golf. Do you take lessons and start to dig into it? You might find different answers, but I hear over and over again, I don't believe I'll actually get better. They may say, oh, I don't want them to change my grip. Well, but what if you change your grip and you got better? Yeah, but I don't think I will because I've tried it in the past. And this story will unravel from them. And you start to realize that the golf professional has been handcuffed, right, into this mentality of fix it. And we've talked about this before, about this leadership role that we have lost, this servant mentality that we get into. Now, a, you know, a servant leader is the, is the highest form of leadership, okay? And that's where we want to get to. But most of us are more on the slave side of leadership, as in do what I want, work on my game. And when it doesn't work, I'm going to blame you and I'm going to blame the golf industry. But we have to take that back on our shoulders because we are the leaders in the industry and we need to make change. And the way to do this is today, I want to go through these five steps, okay? I want to go through this process of showing you how this is done. And I feel that <clears throat> if you understand this, you're really going to start to realize that a lot of you are already doing it, but maybe you're missing it in some areas. And when you apply these, you're going to start to see massive change in your players. Okay, so grab a pen, grab a pencil, your iPad, whatever it may be, chalk, uh, <clears throat> any other form of, uh, you know, cave painting, whatever you, however you take notes. So <clears throat> the first thing that I see is this observation. I see most golf professionals rushing to fix somebody. I've seen you for three or four swings on the range. I've asked you a couple of questions and let's get to work. To me, the biggest thing that's missing in golf instruction today is observation, is this willingness to <clears throat> watch a player play. You know, the, the, the better coaches that I work with, if I look at someone like Vijay Trollio, who's one of our RGX coaches, 
the time that they spend assessing going and watching a player play in tournaments because these juniors are going to go off and play at division one schools and are playing in the u.s amateur and really understanding <clears throat> putting them on combines playing nine holes with them, observing their short game, looking at their stats, looking at their tournament schedules, going this through this whole process, which is exactly what a college coach has to do because he's really, you know, he's going to see your stats, see your tournament results, come and watch you play, see your swing video. Have you come to the school? It's observation, observation, observation. It's not fix. And I think this is one of the first things that we have to do is we've got to take more time to observe our players. I think if you want to see lower scores, you've got to, first of all, understand where are they at? I also see even with a game assessment, right? We, we talked about getting on the course, right? And getting out there and observing someone's game. People are still in a rush to tell them to stand on this side of the tee box, still tell them this club that they should hit and, and to not hit that club and to use a bump and run instead of a lob wedge which is good information once you're in a program, but early days, if you want to drive down people's scores, observe first, and then you can go on to fixing. But I think this is one of the key steps that they miss. So as we go through this, if you have questions, please fire them into the, uh, into the chat box as we go through this. The second thing that I see is outcome. How many of you have a clearly written goal, specific goal of what that person's going to accomplish? You see, so often we hear they, oh, you want to fix the slice, but we never really get down to why they want to fix it and, and where they're at and where they want to get to. So we end up just going and working on something and seeing success for us because on the range, that slice is now turned into a draw because we've got the swing path and the face in place and we're very proud of ourselves. But the player is still shooting 100. And so they don't see the value. And I want you to look at this. If, if the number one reason people don't take lessons is because they don't feel like they're going to get better, each one of these is going to build on itself to make you a coach where right away someone can say, Chad took the time to take me on the course. He had me write out my goals. We sat down for a cup of coffee and he told me where I was and what he saw in my game. And he talked to me about my goals and dived deeper into it. That's a reason to refer a person and they haven't even gone out for their actual first coaching session yet because you've separated yourself from the crowd because you took the time to observe, you took the time to define an outcome. The next step from here is really getting clear on the order. And I think this is where I see golf professionals going to grip rather than going to the lowest hanging fruit. Right. And there's two reasons why this happens. One is we truly believe that if you have a good grip and a good posture and a good alignment, you know, PGA, right, that, you know, posture, grip and alignment, you will build a good swing. <clears throat> but someone who is 57 years old with a bad back who comes over the top of it like Zaro and is chopping down on the ball and shooting 113 and just doesn't want to be embarrassed anymore, probably doesn't need you to work that much on his grip when he's having five lost golf balls and 43 putts around. We've got to start to put down what we believe to be the right path and understand where they're at and where they actually want to go to. Because to me, that's how we actually define a plan of let's get them lag putting. Let's get them working on a hybrid bump and run instead of a lob wedge. Let's get them out of a bunker in one shot, even if you did blade it over the green. At least it's out of the bunker. I mean, I'm being kind of funny about this, but this is truly a lot of our players. We have got to stop them thinking that they need to hit the ball better to shoot lower scores. So it's really important that we get the order right. And I think this is what the best coaches do. If we go to the highest level, I think Butch Harmon, you know, when you look at him as a coach and what he's done for so many different types of players, I think what he's able to do is observe really well, understand an outcome, become number one in the world, and then prioritize that order of what is the one thing that we need to work on rather than, <clears throat> Dustin, let's break your entire swing down and work on that grip because I don't like this. It's let's take the left side of the golf course out of play and start hitting a fade. But it took him a long time and a lot of experience and a lot of wisdom to know that's what he should do with Dustin. And I'm not even sure if that's the first thing that he worked on. The next thing may have been with his wedges, yardage gapping. But he defined these plans and put it out there so that your player understands what they're working towards. And it's just so important to observe, get an outcome, and get the order right. 
Now, here is where I see the problem. You all know that I have a bias towards results-based coaching in groups, right? You know that. But here's the biggest problem, is that before you even get to that, most coaches are stuck with the offer. Because what happens in our head is if we actually do this process, you go, my goodness, I mean, for this person to, you know, they want to break 80, they're shooting 95, <clears throat> it's going to take me at least six months. I need to see them every week. I need to see them for some playing lessons. I'd like to do a TPI screening. Um, they need to do some flexibility work. They need to hit golf balls at least twice a week. Um, and they need a new set of clubs because they've got blades and, and, and this old horrible driver that doesn't fit them. But in our mind, we go, but I think I can get a five pack for them, you know, and, and we sort of, you know, go ahead and we say, look, here's five one hour lessons, because that's what we offer. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to discount it. And, and then we don't give them what they actually need and get honest with them. We offer them, this is what I have for you, instead of building out their program and starting to show them, look, if you really want to go from here to here, this is what's going to take. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to sell them the entire six months. You can say to them, look, I think the first thing we should do for you to gain trust in me is let's go ahead and prioritize this. And as we said, your putting is the number one problem. I'd like to go ahead and just do three sessions on putting, one, more, one playing lesson and then two coaching sessions. And we're just going to work on lag putting and we're just going to get you rolling the ball better so we can take down the putts. And I believe I can take you from a 105 to breaking 100. And at that point, I think you'll have more belief in me, but, but here is what it's going to take for you to get there. And I think when you do that, I was just wondering, I didn't see if Paul Hobart was on the call today. Let's see if Paul's on here, right here, going down to the piece. Oh, no, Paul. Oh, is it? Yeah, Paul is. Yeah, Paul, you've worked for Golf Tech. And I think that's one of the best things that they do, you know, is they lay out, right? I mean, Paul, if you want to unmute yourself just a, real quick here, but I mean, if, if you're on, um, you know, they lay out how many sessions will it work, take to work on your putting? Paul, go ahead and just define a little bit of what they do. I saw you just unmuted yourself. So um, typically there'd be a, a, a swing evaluation process where they come in and we would do a, a um, chat on the phone before they came in the first time and find out where their um, all the parts of their game were. I mean, run through everything from, you know, teeing off to, um, to putting and uh, equipment and everything. And, and then you they actually were, asked them, right, Paul, so, sorry to interrupt, but you asked them, how many, how many lessons do you think it would take to fix your putting? How many do you think it would take to fix your bunker? Don't you go through and sort of add them all up? Yeah, you go, a lot of times if you had, uh, you know, say you had six or seven areas of the game, we would go through and actually write down on a whiteboard, you know, I think we need to spend, you know, six sessions with putting. We need, you know, this many on-course sessions and, and just lay it out. So at some point you'd say, okay, this is the time that we need to allocate to get you to where you want to go. And then if they, you know, if they, for some reason they didn't like that, then you, you'd say, okay, well, what, you know, what should we erase off the board? What can we take off of there that, yep. uh, that we're not going to get to? And how many sessions would it normally be, Paul, when, when you're working for Golf Tech? 50, about um, 50? It would be, I mean, most of them would be six month or 12 month programs and right. encompassing, <laughs> you know, 15 to 40 lessons. Yeah. And I mean, Joe from Golf Tech is awesome and he understands, right? He's not afraid to offer the program. Like this is what you need. It's 40 sessions. It's $4,000. But if they've observed, if you've observed them, if you've got an outcome, you've got an order to it and they see the offer, they see the value, guess what? You're gonna, they're going to go ahead and, and take that opportunity with you. And I think this is one of the big things that we have to focus on is stop just trying to fit them into your three pack of lessons or your five pack or your 10 pack for a discount. Be willing to share it with them. You know, just like if someone's buying a house, be willing to say you want it on the golf course with a swimming pool in a good school district. It's 1.2 million. <laughs> you know, I know you said your budget was 800,000, but I've got to honestly show you this is what it would take. And so when you do that, at least you're laying down the groundwork for success. And then I think this is the biggest one, right? If you really want to make it happen, you want to drive down scores to drive referrals, drive resigns, is you have to get the obligation. You have to have both sides of you commit. You have to be willing to say, listen, I'm in. And, and, and I need a commitment from you. And I think this is really the big part that some of us miss on is we still take back this idea of the sign up, right? Like, yay, they just spent $1,000 with me compared to 
that doesn't make the change. The change happens when you come out, you do the work, you do the homework, you listen, you partake, and in doing so, you get the results. And so I just, I brought up here because I wanted to do this obligation, right? Noun, an act of or, or course of action to which a person is morally or legally bound or a duty or a commitment. It's an obligation. Like if we don't get them to truly sign on the dotted line, and I don't mean give you the money because the money's the easy part. That's the easiest part because they give you the money. They don't have to change. It's about them getting committed and you getting committed. And I think when you build these together from observation, outcome, order, offer, and obligation, you get the guarantee. And I think this is the number one way for you to become a better golf coach and simplify coaching is when you guarantee the result, I'm promising you, you are not going to give them a ton of information because what you've got to do is simplify. And so when it, it's almost like the handcuffs go back on, but in a positive way that you say, I have to get this player. I, I know where they're at. I know where they want to get to. I know the order I'm in. I know what they've signed up for. And I'm obligated to get them that result. So now instead of in an hour lesson, you're like, well, we've got 20 minutes left. What should we work on? Or as you head down to the range, oh, John's showing up today. What should we work on? I wonder what he wants to work on. I've got six more sessions to get this guy six more shots. I've, I've got to move on this. We're meeting on the putting green. We're going to check on his lag putting. We're going to look at his stats. We're going to work on his hybrid again. We're going to head to the bunker. We've got a ton to do today in simplifying his golf game. I've got to, you know, Paul said, look, these six areas. I've got to get him out of the bunker. I've got to get him better at lag putting. I've got to keep him in play. And so it shifts your whole way of thinking. So when that student comes to you and says, well, I didn't practice this week, you say, you didn't practice this week. Is everything okay? Oh yeah, I just got busy. Well, I know you got busy, but our commitment was you told me you were going to practice twice a week and we need to do that to hit your goal. It completely shifts the dynamic because they see the passion that you have to their goal, not just to selling them the product. And I think this is where, Again, a lot of you today may have thought that I was going to talk about simplifying teaching by <clears throat> how to use the Varden grip over the, uh, the double interlock. But I think all of you know well enough for me, each of you are outstanding coaches, outstanding teachers, and you know a heck of a lot more than I do about the game of golf and how you teach people the game of golf, right? You've got tons of wisdom, tons of experience. What it is, is put yourself in a framework that forces you to simplify. Because when there's a guarantee you know you have to get the player there. But how would you possibly guarantee anything if you didn't have someone actually obl obligated to do it? Like if they weren't fully committed in a program that would actually work with an order, a priority of what to work on, right? And an outcome that they desire, having known where their game is, there's no way to simplify your teaching. What you're doing is selling information. You know, hey, you want some more information? Here it is. Come for an hour. I'll give you to this. And I'm hoping you get results. You know, I'm giving you information and hoping for results. That is a terrible, terrible plan if you want to grow a successful coaching business. What you've got to do is get focused on results and start just doing everything you can to get those results. So much now golf instruction is about informational. And remember, if we go back, let's just fire back right here real quick. I'm going to go back to here. It's too expensive. I'm not seeing any value. But if we talk about those five steps, someone's instantly going to see value. I'll get worse before I get better. They shouldn't get worse before you get better. They shouldn't because you're picking the wrong thing to work on. But my driver's a massive slice and you have to change their grip. Give them a five hybrid. Just hey, tell them to tee off with a five hybrid. You can work on their driver when needed. But if they're three putting all the time and they can't keep the ball in play, you, you've put the wrong priority in, in place. That's why they're not actually going to get a lesson from you. OK, I don't want them to change my grip because you're working on things that don't feel comfortable to them. If you can draw up to the plan to them enough that you can say this is why you have to change your grip, that may be one of the areas you change. But as me as a coach, I would never do that before I built their trust. My theory was always based on this. If I get them chipping like crazy, keeping the ball in play and lag putting really well, okay, so they're tapping it up to a foot, two feet, I'm going to get their scores to drop at least six, seven, eight, nine strokes, someone who's shooting mid-90s. I'll get them under 90 into the 80s. They now believe me. At that point, when that trust is built, I then say, listen, you're hitting that five hybrid. I told you we're going to start working on a three wooden a driver. Let's start talking about how we're going to get rid of that slice. Let's go to a seven iron and work out how to get the ball to hook. 
And so to me, they now trust me and they're like, well, he's done this for me. Yeah, let's go. Let's go to that next step. But putting that in the front, okay? Think of it. It's like when people go and work out and the first day they go to CrossFit or they go to something like that. They work out so hard, they throw up and for three days they can't move. It's not exactly a great way to get them back to your gym. I would be saying, how do you make it where you want to come back for more? You're yearning for more because you feel like you're getting better rather than feeling like you're completely lost. So with this said, we're coming down here with the last few minutes. I want you all this week to really go ahead and get honest with yourself and look at this observation, outcome, order, offer, and obligation. Where are you the strongest? So in the chat box, I want you to go ahead one through five. Where are you doing great? Okay, go ahead and put it in the chat box. Let's see some of these coming in. And then I want you to go ahead and then one through five, where are you doing the worst? Okay, so first of all, where are you giving yourself an A? So you can go A1, A2, A3, A4, A5 in the chat box, please. As you're doing that, Ross, I've done nine, uh, nine whole pay lessons, track stats, very in-depth, then a 20-minute conversation afterwards. They build a plan after they count it and three hours of my service, just what I've done recently, and it has been very successful. Outstanding. So the offer, A4, A5, Scott Weiss, obligation, um, Mark Day, A1, Billy, one through five, <laughs> Brian Wise, A3, Jay Davis, A1, Ryan Grooms. Okay, now where would you say you're giving yourself a C you know, or a D if you want? Which area this week can you go and focus in on and get better? Observation, thank you, Paul, for being so honest, right? That's not always an easy one to be honest about observation again, Brian Wise, obligation. Oh no, Brian, you're saying obligation A5. Brian, where are you? Where would you say you need to improve on? Mark Day, C for four. So the offer, getting him into the right offer. Uh, Coach Wayne, obligation again. So for each of you today, like I said, go away from today and apply this. One of the best things I can tell you to do to put it into action is ready. What is it? Not aim, fire, right? Ready, fire, aim. Go and call one of your students right now and just be like, you know what, I've been thinking about you. And I was thinking that, you know what, I just haven't had uh, the commitment to you that you need to have to get to your result. And I've been thinking about this and I want to get a written commitment to make sure we get to your goal. Or I haven't clearly defined your outcome this year. Or in the next lesson you do in the next 15 minutes, sit down with them, observe their game and build a plan for them. The thing is, if you don't put it into action today, it won't go into action tomorrow. And if it doesn't go into action tomorrow, it won't happen. So my challenge to you is to actively go and do this. So to be respectful of your time, everybody, we are coming to the end of the session today. For those of you who want to take it to the next level, you know how I say it, right? I could tell stories all day long, and I do. But if you want to become part of the story, then please hop on and apply. Let's get an application in and let's get on the phone. I would love to talk to you um, about, I'll type it in here so you've got it, uh, about your business, about what you're doing, about where you need help. Uh, and for those of you who are on RGX, look forward to seeing you on calls this week. Um, and for those of you, oh, let me just do this. I got to change that. It was just Jay Davis I was responding to here. So everyone, um, rgx, rgxcoach.com slash apply. Um, I'll see you again next week. But the biggest thing for today is go and actually do what we just talked about. Remember, I'm going to put it back up on the screen right here. So you've got it. Make sure to go and implement one of these with your next lesson. Make it an amazing week and I'll catch you all next week. Thanks.